<clears throat> okay, and welcome back, everyone. This is Crockett's OG TV. This is the 24th session of this particular uh, grouping of broadcasts where we go through the 12th edition of the Guide to the Test, the official guide question by question, and in the process of going through question by question, we got up through, last time, question number 192 on page 179. So we're going to pick up with number 193 on page 179, the last problem on that page. My name is Jim Jacobson, and I will be guiding you through some of the problems in the official guide today. <clears throat> so, without further ado, let us begin. Uh, so, page... 179, number 193, 10%, 20%, 30%, 50%, or 60%. So if 75% of a class answered the first question on a certain test correctly, 55% answered the second question on the test correctly, and 20% answered neither of the questions correctly. What percent answered both correctly? So a formula that you should remember on the GMAT, I know I keep giving you a lot of these, but one that you definitely want to remember is how to compute overlapping sets, or at least know how to, der how to derive them. So when you have overlapping sets, you know, usually shown by a Venn diagram like this, uh, where this is A, this is B, uh, and this is those that are in neither. The total equals A plus B minus both plus neither. So, and the reason why we subtract both in this case is that uh, to avoid double counting them, because if we count all of the ones in A and all of the ones in B, we, we end up counting this middle area twice, which misrepresents the number of things in the set. So we need to uh, remove one of those double kinds and then of course also account for those that are neither. In this particular case, we have uh, 75 that did um, A, 55% um, that did B, and then 20% did neither. I personally write the numbers outside the circle. Um, <clears throat> I guess that's just my personal technique, so that then when I know the number that is both, I can also figure out the number that only did B. So differentiating all of those within this circle versus those that are in, I should probably differentiate it this way. I write the number in the circle, that would be just that number. For example, anyway, it doesn't really matter in this particular question, but I just, I got in that habit. So, um, Right, so A plus B minus both plus neither. In this case, we actually know the total, so, um, and we know A and B. So we have 75 for A plus 55 for B minus both. We still don't know what both is. We'll call it B. No, we shouldn't because then it's not clear whether it's B or both. Okay, so 75 plus 55 minus both plus 20 equals the total, which is 100. So we're just assuming there's 100 students in the class. Uh, so we're using the percents as the actual numbers. It will work out in the end. You can just trust me on that one. So 75 plus 55 is 130, plus another 20 is 150. So 150 minus both equals 100. Therefore, both equals 50. And remember, we have to convert that back to a percent, but since there are no answer choices that are not percents, it's pretty easy to do. D, choice D, 50% of the students got both questions correct. So that's a 50 in there. On to the next page. <clears throat> so page 180, question 194, closing in on the end of the problem solving section. So we have negative 3, negative 2, negative 3 and 2. two. So clearly we can tell there's already, we can already tell there's some kind of conceptual thing because it's all the same numbers, 3s and 2s. Um, 3 and negative 2, and then 2 and 3. 
So in the rectangular coordinate system above, the line y equals x is the perpendicular bisector of segment AB, not shown, and the x-axis is the perpendicular bisector of segment BC, not shown. If the coordinates of point A are 2, 3, what are the coordinates of point C? Okay, so we can't really do this one without, well, it, I suppose we could do this one without a diagram, but we're not going to. I really do think this one is much clearer with a diagram showing what's what. And we'll put some So we have a line that is uh, drawn for us. And this guy is y equals x. We have point A, which is 2, 3, right there. What else do we know? So we know that point B, um, so we know that uh, this line, y equals x, is the perpendicular bisector of um, line AB, which means that, um, well, it means, for example, uh, that the line here, so I'm, I'm gonna do this in a separate color. Line AB uh, is going to be uh, perpendicular to this line, so I'm not drawing it where it's actually going to be. We just need to know that it's, uh, not only is it perpendicular, but the same distance on one side of the line is the same distance on the other. So basically it is mirroring um, the, um, the line on either side. That's what it means to be the perpendicular bisector. So whatever distance it is over here, it is over here. Uh, the mirror of a line y equals x will, will just reverse the coordinates. So um, <clears throat> just as a here is two, three, um, b will be three, two. So B, which is 3, 2. Creates exactly the same distance across this line, and I'll do it in a different color. So, we already know where point B is. Um, we need the coordinates for point C. We find out from the problem that the x-axis is the perpendicular bisector in turn of line BC. That means that line BC will be parallel to the y-axis, and that it, there will also, again, be the same distance above and below that bisector, which means it's another mirror. Um, in this particular case, then, it means it will have the same x value as um, uh, point b. And actually, on that basis alone, we can eliminate almost all of the answer choices, uh, because, uh, choice, because point b has its x point, x coordinate of 3, uh, choice uh, point C, oh my gosh, uh, point C will also have the x value of 3, which allows us to eliminate A, B, C, and E. So choice D must be the correct one, but just to illustrate why, how, this, how the y coordinate comes to be, I probably shouldn't have said comes to be because it makes it even more confusing. Anyway, um, so point uh, C is also mirrored over the x axis. So just as B is 2 above the x-axis, C will be 2 below the x-axis, and it'll be at 3, negative 2, that's point C. So each of these points has a perpendicular bisector, and that allows us, the mirroring effect of a perpendicular bisector allows us to figure out exactly the coordinates, even though we were only given one initially. So answer choice D is the correct one. One eighty number one ninety five. So we have one dollar, two dollars, three dollars, four dollars, and twelve dollars. So a store currently charges the same price for each towel that it sells. If the current price of each towel were to be increased by $1, 10 fewer of the towels could be bought for $120, excluding sales tax. What is the current price of each towel? So let's start putting um, variables to the things that we have here. 
P equals the current price, and or yeah, and then N equals the number that you can, the number that you're buying. So currently, um, they can purchase uh, at the current price times a certain number equals one hundred twenty dollars. We also know that if the price were increased by one dollar, so P plus one you can purchase 10 fewer towels for $120. So there's our two equations and two variables. Those are satisfied. Um, basically then we uh, can solve for uh, n first. So um, we'll do this one over here. So we have p plus one times n minus 10 equals 120. Um, so we're using FOIL to multiply all the parts off. So we end up with uh, Pn uh, plus n minus 10p minus 10. <clears throat> equals 120. Oops. So then we uh, subtract 120 from both sides. Well, actually, let's not subtract 120 from both sides. One of the things that we can see here is that Pn itself, this initial equation, can be substituted in to our equation over here. We have a Pn. So this 120 plus n minus 10p minus 10 equals 120. So now we can subtract 120 from both sides. We get n minus 10p minus 10 equals 120. And so then we can do n minus 10 times p minus 1, or p plus 1, actually, p plus 1 equals 120. Oh, that should be zero. Subtracted 120 from both sides. So then we have uh, n equals 10 times p plus 1, because we just added 10 times the quantity p plus 1 to both sides. And once again, we can actually use our, um, our friend here, p times n equals 120. By multiplying this whole um, expression times p, if we multiply the whole thing times p, we end up with np again out here equals 10 times p times p plus 1. So then we get 120 because pn or np equals 120 <laughs> equals 10p squared plus 10p. We can divide all of this by 10. So then we get p squared plus p equals 12. And then it starts to look like a regular quadratic equation. We get p squared plus p minus 12 equals 0. And then we end up with our two factors. We have uh, p plus 4 and p minus 3 equals 0. So uh, p equals, well, we can only have a positive price. So we could ignore the p value. So it equals negative 4 or 3. We can ignore the negative value. And we are left with Choice C, $3 is the current price per towel. So this is an interesting question in that um, one of the equations is actually substituted, able to be substituted more than once. When you're given something kind of simple like this, uh, two numbers multiplied together, be on the lookout for opportunities to multiply the whole expression by one of the other two variables um, to be able to just substitute an actual number in for that product. That's because we were able to do it twice here.
Okay, 180, number 196. top of the page. 70, 80, 90, 100, and 110. So in the table above, what is the number of green marbles in jar R? P, Q, R, uh, red, green, total. So I'm reproducing the table just uh, so I don't have to keep looking over at the book. X, Y, 80, Y, Z, 120, and then X, Z, 160. So, I mean, basically this gives us three equations at, you know, because each of these uh, lines in the chart, each horizontal line is, a, is a, an equation. We know that x plus y equals 80, y plus z equals 120, and uh, this is an x, x plus z equals 160. And uh, so when you're given three equations and three variables, you can basically solve it however you want. You know, combining um, some of these, uh, you can substitute, figure out the val value of one variable, substitute it in a second equation to figure out the third variable. However you want to do it is fine. So I personally started out with uh, y. So we're trying to ultimately figure out the number of green marbles in jar R, and that equals z. So if we start out with um, y plus z equals 120 and subtract from it, so we're trying to solve uh, for jar r, so I started off with the other two jars, um, y plus x equals um, 180, so this is, or just 80, so this is jars p and q, and you can subtract the two. So y minus y is 0, z minus x is z minus x, and the difference between them is 40. Then we use our remaining uh, equation, the one from jar r, um, because so z minus x equals, let's just rewrite it out separately, z minus x equals 40, we can rewrite as um, x equals z minus 40. Add an x to both sides, subtract a 40 from both sides. So x equals z minus 40. Now we'll use our equation from jar r. I'm just matching these up here. So we have x plus z, remember we're solving for z, equals 160. We know that x equals z minus 40, so we have z minus 40 plus z equals uh, 160, 2z minus 40 equals 160, add 40, 2z equals 200, therefore z equals 100. That's your choice D. There's other ways you can go about it, uh, solving, you can do different substitutions and combinations and whatever. Uh, it will always come out to be the right answer as long as you do your math correctly. So whichever method, combination, and substitution just appeals to you in the moment, that's what you should do because it'll work. I actually can't think of an instance where you can do one and not the other. It's just usually one or the other is slightly faster because of the way the, the equations are set up. Okay. 180, number 197. So 750 pi, 1500 pi, 1875 pi, 3000 pi, or 7,500 pi. It's a lot of pi. A point on the edge of a fan blade that is rotating in a plane is 10 centimeters from the center of the fan. 
What is the distance traveled in centimeters by this point in 15 seconds when the fan runs at the rate of 300 revolutions per minute? So one of the important things to know before we even hit the answer choices, even though I already wrote them down, is we are going from revolutions per minute to um, basically revolutions per second. So we have a units shift. Very important to recognize those. Um, and you can even kind of see um, that uh, 750 and 7500 um, are just a different power of 10. So that might be a way that we could have ended up making a mistake. We're not going to, but if we did, that was possible. The other thing that we need to know is we're dealing with a, with a circle, a circular fan blade, but it doesn't really matter that it's a fan blade. Uh, all we know is that the uh, point on the edge of a fan blade is 10 centimeters from the center. So this is the center, my blobby circle. That's 10 centimeters, which is then the radius. The formula for the circumference of a circle, and you should have all of the formulas for a circle memorized on test day. Uh, basically, there will be problems that you cannot solve without knowing these formula formulas. Um, so circumference, which is the distance around a circle, this is the circumference. Circumference is Latin for carrying around, if that helps you remember it. Um, it's 2 times pi times the radius. And in this case, we know what the radius is. We know the radius is 10, so the circumference of this particular circle is 20 pi. Of course, we're not done. The other thing that we know is that it does uh, 300 revolutions per minute. And we need to know how many is that uh, per second, or well, really, we need to know how many um, it will do. How many that is in 15 seconds? So 300 revolutions per minute equals 300 revolutions in 60 seconds. And to get to 15 seconds, we would need to divide by four. So that equals uh, 75 revolutions every 15 seconds. Okay, so 75 revolutions every 15 seconds, and we need to know the distance traveled. So if, it, if the point on the end of the fan blade goes 20 pi every revolution, and it does, it's going to go around uh, 75 times in the 15 seconds for the question. You multiply it times 75, and uh, that's really all there is to it. Um, that's, you know, 75 times 10 times 2 times pi. So 75 times 10 is 750 times 2 is 1500 times pi. 1500 pi is our answer. That's a lot of times around the fan. One eighty, number one ninety eight. So three, four, six, eight. Forgive me for not writing out the numbers. So if four, or sorry, if n equals four p, where p is a prime number greater than two, how many different positive even divisors does n have, including n? Okay, so um, I guess the place to start here is realizing that, so we have um, n equals 4p. The, and so divisors are the same things as factors. So the prime factorization of uh, 4p, we know p is a prime number and we know 4 isn't. So 4p, the prime factorization ends up being um, p is a prime number times 4, and 4 itself is 2 times 2. So the prime factorization is 2 times 2 times p. So the factors of 4p are, um, well, of course, 1, 2, 4, 2p, 
and 4p. And then the question is asking, how many different positive even divisors does, um, does uh, n have? So uh, we just count out the ones of this prime factorization. Of the factors of 4p, how many of these are even? Well, you know, one's not, but 2, 4, 2p, and 4p all are because even times anything is even. So, uh, and we know even though the p isn't 2, 2 is 2, <laughs> and uh, an even number times anything will give you an even number. So these are all even. So those four factors are even divisors of n. One ninety nine on page one eighty. One, two, three, one, three, two. The order apparently matters here. Two, three, one. Three, one, two, and three, two, one. Okay. The data sets one, two, and three above are ordered from greatest standard deviation to least standard deviation in which of the following. So we should probably should write them out. Um, one is seventy two. 73, 74, 75, and 76. 2 is 74 all the way. 1, 3 is 62, 74, 74. 89. So we need greatest standard deviation to least standard deviation. So remember standard deviation, and you need to know the definition, if not how to compute it on the GMAT. Um, although knowing how to compute it is kind of handy. We had a problem towards the beginning of the problem solving set. Um, where it really helped to kind of understand a little bit more deeply how to compute it. But in this particular one, we don't know, have to know anything about how to compute standard deviation, just what it represents. Standard deviation is the average distance um, of the numbers in a set from the average of the set. So uh, the more the same, the closer together all the numbers are in a set, the lower the standard deviation. Um, or the lower the average distance from the average. Um, and then the more spread out the numbers are, the higher the standard deviation. So um, with that in mind, we can actually just look at the sets and see um, you know, how close together they, they look. The one with the least standard deviation has to be statement two. All the numbers are the same, so all of them are exactly the same distance from the average of the set. The average of the set is 74, and all of them have a distance of zero from that. So. Um, least standard deviation must be two, uh, statement two. So even if we knew nothing else about this one, we can cross off answer choices A, C, and E, and we have a 50% chance of getting this question right. Um, it, so then the question is, which has more spread out numbers um, from the average? So in uh, the case of um, statement one, um, the average is going to be, because they're incremented by 1, the average is actually going to be the median, 74. And uh, these are each 1 away and these are each 2 away, so that's a relatively low standard deviation. Um, here, the median is still 74, but then this one, it, the 89 is uh, 15 higher and um, 62 is 12 lower. So. Um, even accounting for averaging out those distances, the, dis the 
the fact that 89 and 62 are much further out from the center than, um, than they are in statement one makes this one the one with the, so this one was least, Clearly the one with 62 and 89 is going to have the greatest standard deviation because this will have a much higher average distance from the middle. Um, so the greatest standard deviation is statement three, which means statement two will be the one in the middle. Oh, I put two in there twice. Um, three, one, two. This is a one. This is now Roman numeral one there. Three, one, two is the order. So um, answer choice D is the correct one. Uh, the, the, answer, the answer choice in the official guide goes into more actual calculation of the uh, averages of these two. Um, Feel free to look at that if you're more interested in the more mathematical solution. Uh, there are times, of course, when it's nice not to have to do the math and be able to solve the question without it. So that's what we did on this one. OK, so next page, page 181, question 200. We have 15, 17, 20. 25 and 30. So of the 50 researchers in a work group, 40% will be assigned to team A and the remaining 60% to team B. However, 70% of the researchers prefer team A and 30% prefer team B. What is the lowest possible number of researchers who will not be assigned to the team they prefer? So what's really happening? Really? Team A and Team B. There's going to be uh, so, oh, so we have 50 researchers in a in a work group. 50 people. So 40% um, of 50 is 20, and then 60% uh, is the remaining 30. So. 40% are assigned to team A, which is 20 people. 60%, uh, the remaining 60% are assigned to team B, which is 30 people. What they really want is actually 70% um, prefer team A. So now we have to figure out what 70% is. And we have to then the remaining 30% prefer team B. So you just figure 10% uh, of 50 people is 5. So 7 times that 10% will be 70%. That's 35 people is 75. Um, and of course, we can just subtract. But we could also say 10% is 5. So you know, 6 times that is, uh, or uh, sorry, 3 times that is 15. So what's really happening is, or what, what they want to happen is 35 want to be in team A and uh, 15 want to be in team B. So let's start off by assigning people to the maximum number of people to the things that they want to be assigned to. So 15 lucky people, because we're trying to figure out the lowest, how to make the most number of people happy, the least number of people unhappy. So we do this by assigning as many as possible to the teams they actually want to be on. Um, so all 15 people who want to be on team B can be on team B. All 15 go there. Um, however, because only 20 people will be assigned to team A, um, we can only assign 20. So uh, the max is 20. For team A, which means 15 people are going to be sad because 35 wanted to be on it. And um, we're trying to figure out the lowest possible number of researchers who will not be assigned to the team they prefer. Um, this 15 that wanted to be on A but can't be on A are actually going to be the other half of the 30 on team B. So these 15 sad ones, the difference between the number who wanted to be on A and the number who can actually be on A. Um, that's the, our lowest possible number of sad researchers. 
Answer choice A. I guess I probably should have done the want over the reality. Um, so the 15, just to be clear, is the want minus really equals 15. 35 minus 20 equals 15. And with that, we move on. So 181, 201. Negative 5, 0, 5, 25, and 27.5. So if m is the average of the first 10 positive multiples of 5, and if m is the capital M is the median of the first 10 positive multiples of 5, what is the value of the capital M minus the little m? Yeah, okay. So um, things to remember then, the average formula, the average equals the sum of the numbers divided by the, um, the number of the numbers that we're averaging together. And the other thing to, rem to remember is the definition of the median. The median of a set is the middle number when you have uh, an odd number of numbers in the set, and it's the average of the two middle numbers when you have an even number of numbers in the set. What is the set we are talking about? We are talking about the first 10 positive multiples of 5. So those numbers are 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, and 50. First 10 positive multiple first seven first 10 positive multiples of 5. Um, so the average of those would be adding all of these together and dividing by 10. Uh, when adding these together, a shortcut is, so you can just flat, uh, flat out add them, or you could say to yourself, well, you know, we have 50 here. This is how I often do math. Uh, 5 plus 45 is another 50. 4 plus 40 plus 10 is another 50. Here's another 50. And here's another 50. So we can just count the 50s. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That's 250 plus another 25 equals 275. And we're figuring out the average. So that's divided by 10. The average equals 27.5. That's um, lowercase m. So here there's the trap answer. This is the value of m. The median of the set would be the middle number if we have an odd number of numbers, but since there are 10 numbers in the set, the average is the, um, or excuse me, the median is the average of the middle two numbers. The middle two numbers are 25 and 30, so our median is the average of these two, um, 25 plus 30 divided by 2 and in this particular case um, it ends up being the same thing um, 27.5 is also the median so capital M is 27.5 so so it's both M and M um, we subtract m minus m, which is, just to be explicit, 27.5 minus 27.5, that is going to equal 0. Answer choice B. So we could have also, uh, if we had figured out capital M first and realized that, um, uh, that 27.5 was the median, we might have also seen, and this is what the, the official guide points out, that all the numbers radiate equally because we're dealing with multiples of five. Every other number is exactly the same distance from that median on either side, which would tell us right away that the mean and the median would be the same thing. Uh, it didn't take that much longer to do the extra math, but if you can save yourself a step, that's great. Not a big deal if you didn't. So answer choice B is the correct one. All right, one eighty 
201, number 202. We have 100M, 1 over 100M, 1 over M, 10 over M, and 10,000 over M. So if m is greater than 0 and x is m percent of y, then in terms of m, y is what percent of x? Gosh. Okay. So let's start off with what we were actually given. x is m percent of y. x is, that's x equals m percent. Every percent is really just a fraction out of, out of 100. So m percent is the same thing as m over 100 m percent of y. And we're ultimately trying to get what y equals. y equals something percent of x. So we're trying to get to y equals, and there's going to be, you know, somewhere in here there's going to be an m, and, some, and then the x is assumed. So uh, in order to get y by itself, we would multiply both sides times 100. So then we get 100x equals m times y. <clears throat> and then we divide both sides by m. So we get y equals 100x over m. Or another way to put it, y equals 100m times x. The GMAT did us a favor by not giving us this as an answer choice because a lot of people would figure, well, 100 over M, that's when you divide you know, 100 by M, that's the percentage. Um, except, of course, it's not. Remember, when you get a fraction, um, let's just pick uh, 3 fourths. 3 fourths, to express 3 fourths as a percent, everybody knows that it's 75. When you divide 3 by 4, I know you know how to do this, but I'm just kind of demonstrating a point here. Um, you actually get, I have to add some uh, zeros in there, um, we get uh, 28, 28. So we actually get 0.75. To go from 3 fourths to an actual number for the percent, we need to multiply times 100 because we have this intervening step where we actually got 0.75. We need to multiply times 100 to get the decimal point two points to the right. That's a times 100. So this fraction, 100 over m, needs to actually be multiplied times 100 to actually be the percent if we knew what m was and could do the division. So it's actually y equals 100 times 100 over m times x to get the percent, which then is y equals 10,000 over m times x. And 10,000 over m is the actual percent. Choice E. Pretty tricky. Alrighty. 181, number 203. Three, four, five, six, seven. Three, four, five, six, seven. What is the twenty-fifth digit to the right of the decimal point in the decimal form of six elevenths? So here we just really have to figure out what this decimal is going to equal. So um, eleven goes into six. We don't have any. So long division plays a prominent role in the GMAT. Um, We'll add some zeros in there. So 11 goes into 65 times, we would get 55. 11 goes into 54 times. Five times. Four. Okay, so we can see that it is 0.54 repeating. I put that over the wrong one. Let's do that. It is 0.54 repeating, so that means the digits are, you know, 54, 54, 54. I suppose we could write this out all the way to the 25th digit, but I'm, I've got better things to do with my time, and so do you. So 
The first digit after the decimal point is a 5, the second one's a 4, the third one's a 5, the fourth one's a 4. You get the idea. Uh, here we have the odd, the odd digits um, equal 5, and then the even digits after the decimal point, the, two, the second, the fourth, the sixth, etc. The evens equal 6. Uh, we're ask, asked about the 25th digit to the right of the decimal point, which would be an odd number. So it would be one of the five. The evens equal four. Oh my gosh. That's what I get for talking and writing at the same time. So um, they alternate between five and four. The odd numbered decimal places are fives. The evens are four. 25 is odd. Therefore, it will be answer choice C. It will be one of the fives. Okay. Uh, yes. 181, number 204. We have 4y, 5y, 6y, 8y, and 9y. So John and Mary were each paid X dollars in advance to do a certain job together. John worked on the job for 10 hours, and Mary worked two hours less than John. If Mary gave John Y dollars of her payment so that they would have received the same hourly wage, what was the dollar amount in terms of Y that John was paid in advance? So John and Mary were each paid X dollars in advance, which means we are ultimately solving for X. We, our, our final answer is X equals, you know, whatever it is. Okay, so... We want John's wage and we want John's wage and Mary's wage to be equal to each other so we can actually set up some equations. So let's let W equal um, the shared hourly wage that they didn't actually get because again, um, they were paid a flat fee and the fact that Mary got done more quickly means that uh, she actually made more per hour. So in order to equalize it, she gave John some of her money. Um, what this means then is um, Mary's uh, initial payment, Mary got X dollars, she gave Y to John, um, and that equaled eight hours at this shared hourly wage rate, which is, you know, Again, kind of imaginary since they weren't actually paid by the hour. John uh, was given those Y dollars by Mary on top of his flat fee, um, which means actually that John made more money on for for the uh, for the same job than Mary did, just to have their hourly wages equal out. Anyway, um, that equals ten times uh, that imaginary hourly wage rate because he worked 10 hours and Mary worked eight. So um, then what we can do is we can just, uh, you know, we, we can substitute some stuff in here. Um, we know that for, we actually we can, I prefer the combination method. So if we do X plus Y equals 10 W um, and we subtract Mary's wage, subtract X minus Y, equals 8w, uh, x minus x equals 0, y minus negative y equals 2y, 10 minus 8 equals 2w, so then um, we arrive at the conclusion that y equals w. However, the question is actually asking us what x equals. So we know that, uh, we're, and we're dealing with John's wage here, right? So. Um, that's this equation here, x plus y equals 10w. So we can substitute in um, the fact that w equals y, which we found out down here. So 10 plus y, or excuse <laughs> x plus y equals 10y, because remember w and y are the same thing, they're interchangeable. We subtract a y from both sides, we get x equals 9y. Answer choice E. And I think we have time for the next one. 205 on page 181. 
3, 6, 9, 12, 24. So in the rectangular coordinate system above, if point R lies on the positive y-axis and the area of triangle ORP is 12, what is the y-coordinate of point R? So we are given some axes here, and P here is at 4, 0. Um, point R is somewhere on the y-axis. We don't actually know what its value is. There's O. Um, and then we are talking about triangle ORP, so I'm actually going to start using some different colors here. So these are some imaginary things there. We also find out that the area of triangle ORP is 12. So remember the area of a triangle. Area of a triangle equals one half the base times the height. So we know that 12, which is the area, equals one half of the base. And we know that the base has a length of four because we know the P coordinate. So one half of four times the height, which is the Y coordinate of point R. I guess the four and the Y look kind of similar. I didn't really think about that in my handwriting. Anyway, that's a Y. So uh, multiply both sides times two. Um, first, it doesn't really matter what we do, but 24, or what order we do them in. Uh, and then we divide both sides by uh, four. So y equals six. So the y coordinate of point R is six. Answer choice B. Um, I think I can actually fit this last one in on this page uh, in this time period. So we have the last one on page 181, which is question 206. A is 1.5, 2.0, sorry about that, 2.5, 3.0, 4.0, Car A is 20 miles behind car B, which is traveling in the same direction along the same route as car A. Car A is traveling at a constant speed of 58 miles per hour, and car B is traveling at a constant speed of 50 miles per hour. How many hours will it take for car A to overtake and drive 8 miles ahead of car B? So, car A, car B. So, it doesn't actually matter how far apart, or how what their actual distances or their actual speeds are. We just need to know that every hour car A catches up eight miles. So this is eight miles per hour faster. So with no time at all, there are 20 miles between them. That's what it says in the first sentence, car A is 20 miles behind car B. After one hour, uh, car A gains eight miles. So one hour, gaining eight miles. After the second hour, car A gains another eight miles and is only four miles behind car B. So if it gains eight miles every one hour, it gains four miles every half hour. It gains half as much in half an hour. One half an hour passes, plus four, Car A and car B are the same distance from each other. So in two and a half hours, car A and car B are at the same point. That is, of course, the trap answer here. Um, this is when they meet. The question is asking us, when does car A actually get eight miles ahead of car B? So uh, since it goes eight miles every hour, when it's caught up, it'll be exactly one more hour before it's eight hours ahead. So then we add one more hour. Um, add another eight, and it's eight miles ahead. So one, two, three and a half hours later, car A has caught up to car B. And gone eight miles ahead. Sorry, that's what the question was actually asking. Okay, so I think this is gonna be a good place to stop. Um, so we finished off uh, up through 206 on page 181. Next time we will turn the page 
do uh, page 182, question number two, uh, 207. Um, you've been listening to and watching, I suppose, Crockett's OGTV, the GMAT edition, where we go through the official guide to the test. That's the 12th edition of the official guide, and uh, it's a lot easier slash more fun, <laughs> uh, easier to follow anyway, if you have the book in front of you when you're, when you're watching this broadcast, or at least have the problems that troubled you when you're watching this broadcast. My name's Jim Jacobson. This is my picture of me in front of a giant cherry in Minnesota, a uh, giant cherry and a giant spoon, and uh, hope to see you next time. In the meantime, happy studying.